Um, so hopefully everybody can hear me, but um, it's, it's wonderful to be here with you today and hopefully this is a friendly face for you as well. Um, uh, I wanted to take the opportunity just to give you all a brief update on the work that we're undertaking on the standards and guidance more widely at CIFA. And you may have heard this several times, but um, check. <laughs> But this is just a, a recap and it will be, I will be going through it quite quickly. So feel free to grab me later um, if you have uh, any questions or queries. Um, just a bit of an outline. Um, CIFA currently has 13 standards and guidance covering a variety of different areas um, of archaeological activities. And as Duncan's already mentioned, we've got documents specifically focused on archaeological materials and archives. Um, these define good practice and they also expand on the principles that are outlined within the code of conduct. Um, breaking the documents down, the standard at the top of the documents are only a few lines long, and these define um, the required outcome for the activity that you're undertaking, with the guidance advising on how that outcome might be reached. The standard is mandatory for accredited members and um, registered organisations, and the guidance is, is advisory. The information within these documents are really built around what we call the three P's. So focusing on principle, process and product. So really looking at the overlying principles, um, the outcomes and, and how we're going to get there. Um, it's important to know that the standards and guidance and the information within them are formulated by the sector. Um, we consult with specialists, we consult with special interest groups and the information is heavily consulted on as well. So it's not just me or other CIFA members and staff writing these independently. They are consulted on widely and they're based on current understanding of good practice. Um, they're used when commissioning and designing archaeological works. Um, they provide um, project stakeholders with assurance of, of work being undertaken to a consistent um, format. Um, and the majority of work being undertaken um, as part of the planning system in the UK um, specifies compliance with CIFA standards and guidance. So you'll often see reference to this in WSIs and project designs as well. Um, the standard and guidance documents need to respond to change and expectations, and these may um, stem from innovations or changes in uh, legislation or policy or just evolving practice. Um, and this is where we've we've come a bit stuck at the moment, as, as you'll acknowledge, um, the information out there is, is out of date um, for the most part, not all of them, but um, definitely some of the older documents. The last significant update was undertaken in 2014 when we were chartered, but there have been some more minor updates recently, and I've just highlighted the two more significant ones um, that came out of the archive selection toolkit project and dig digital as well. So we added uh, information into the guidance focusing on um, the need for selection strategies and data management plans. And that really shows this cycle of um, recommendations that come out of projects that then get fed into the, the guidance and then become expected practice and then the cycle carries on. And um, so that's why it's really important to um, continue having these collaborative projects um, uh, between the groups. Um, and just to say that we're not changing everything. So um, the standards and guidance, you know, they've been around a long time. They represent a robust infrastructure, but we do acknowledge that they are um, in need of a review and update. Um, so the current structure, this is what you'll be used to. So if you go online now, you'll open up a standards and guidance PDF document and the standard and the guidance appear together in that document. They all still sit under the code of conduct and they're supported by other documents within our regulatory framework. So policy statements and practice papers, and then the fabulous toolkit series we have and other resources on the website. Um, the most um, or the majority of the changes that you'll see with the new structure coming out is to how we're organising the guidance. Um, so this will be the new structure when it's launched later this year. Um, so this is, you can't see right at the top, but this is the regulatory framework. So everything still sits under the code of conduct, but we're separating the standards away from the guidance. So the standards will be sitting separately and the guidance is going to be split into two tiers. Um, using tiers, it doesn't mean that one's any more important than the other. That's, that's just the terminology we've been using in-house. Um, so we'll have universal um, clauses using more generic language. So we're not referring to any specific jurisdiction within those clauses. And then we'll have um, a section um, on detailed or specific guidance related to undertaking work in a specific jurisdiction. And I think the majority of the information we'll be talking about today would fit into, fit into that category. And again, these are all supported by the other resources that we have. Um, so why are we doing this? Um, uh, this is where, well, in terms of starting with the UK, this is where most of our members are based. Um, 
I haven't done the recent, recent numbers, but still the majority, 98% of our members are based in the UK. Um, uh, and we need to acknowledge that since many of the original standards and guidance documents were published, especially the fieldwork documents, which I think are some of the earliest, uh, in addition to the fines one as well, I've heard, um, archaeological practice has changed across the four nations and planning regimes have devolved. Um, this has meant that the application of guidance has become problematic or difficult in some areas. Um, and also um, a lot of the documents have an Anglo-centric focus. Um, and, you know, in addition to that, we need to ensure that the language and terminology is updated as well. Um, however, that said, awareness and recognition of CIFA beyond the UK is growing alongside increases in accreditation both individual members and also organisations. In the last couple of years, we've had a German registered organisation um, and we've got more to come as well. Um, in addition to the fact we've had um, a registered organisation um, in the Republic of Ireland for years now as well. Um, this is why as a professional body representing archaeologists, both in the UK and overseas, we need to ensure that the standards and guidance has a universal focus um, that's supported by jurisdiction specific guidance. Um, and that's easy to say, um, but it's by no means a straightforward process and it's going to take time. Um, we need to consider how guidance in different jurisdictions aligns with the CIFA framework and how to approach things if they don't. Um, we started this process already by undertaking a project looking at the alignment of guidance in Northern Ireland funded by the Historic Environment Division and Rhonda will be speaking later about um, some of the work um, associated with that. Um, and the information from this will help us see how we might be able to apply the same process for the jurisdictions but then again the same process might not work so it's um it's, it's going to be a long road but hopefully a useful one um and we're also fortunate to have the support of colleagues and experts in our special interest groups um with our area groups established in australia germany and then our international practice group um just to highlight um of those two percent we've got members based in the following 16 um, uh, countries and jurisdictions. Um, however, this is only the tip of the iceberg if you consider where um, archaeologists are actually working, um, you know, as opposed to where they're, they're based. So this list would be a lot longer um, if we look at those stats as well. So again, emphasising the importance of moving towards more global standards um, supported by universal guidance. Um, so just briefly, what have we been doing? Supporting this process um, a few years back now, because this has been ongoing for a while, um, we set up the Professional Standards Advisory Panel. Um, there's several people from um, both finds and archives involved in this process. So they've been helping us to support the UK updates um, and we'll be widening that out as we move um, through different jurisdictions as well. The fieldwork standards and guidance. Hopefully you'll have seen the consultation that came out earlier this year. Um, there now ready we've taken on board the consultation feedback which by the way it's essential we, we do read all the comments i read all the comments and we do make changes associated with the feedback we get so if you see a consultation please do respond to it um, so they're coming out before the end of the year and this is just the, the standards and the tier one guidance the next stage linking all the jurisdiction guidance is coming next um, in addition to that, we've involved in several collaborations. So I've already mentioned the um, project we undertook with HED, um, and Duncan's already mentioned the, the HE-funded toolkit series, and I know Peter will be talking later about the Roman coinage toolkit, um, and these have been uh, proved to be a fantastic delivery a vehicle for delivery of good practice guidance um, supporting the standards and guidance. Um, and then we're involved in several other things, wider strategies, 21st century challenges for archaeology, which is England focused, archaeology 2030 in Northern Ireland and the Scotland's um, archaeology strategy. So all of these involve standards and guidance. So there's a lot of information coming um, from different quarters. Um, so just finally, then, just to sum up um, what's next. So I so say this has been a really quick um, run through of what we're doing. So feel free to contact me or grab me at tea break. But um, as I say, we're launching the fieldwork documents later this year. Um, we'll be starting the process with the other documents. Um, I'm spinning plates at the minute because it's only really me doing this. So there are several things going on at once, but I'm hoping to start discussions with the Finds and Archives Committee next year, um, looking at the initial process of what needs updating um, and, and what we can do so we can work together initially on that. And I say, just keep an eye out for consultations because I do read them. <laughs> Um, and it is really useful. You're the experts. Um, that's why we need your help. But um, hopefully that's just been a, a, a quick overview. Thank you.